of the pharmacy and health sciences. Yeah. Um, I completed my residency at Parkland Health and Hospital System in Annual Care um, in 2005 before you had to do a PUI1 and a PUI2, so I did a PUI2. And I worked in the healthcare arena for clinically for about 10 years at their health system. Then I went to a Markham and now I'm with UTMB health system. And I am a pharmacy operations manager. And um, over my career, I've done a couple of uh, lectures here at Texas Southern. This is the lecture that keeps on giving. It's a quality improvement lecture. It's not a fun, exciting lecture, but I guarantee you when you go on rotations and you see some of your pharmacy preceptors using some of these tools as I introduce them, you already know about them. I've had several students come back to me um, and send me an email or they they're on site, yeah, and they come on board, they'll tell me that they've used a lot of the flow sheets, um, some of the charts that we're going to introduce today. So they're very helpful. Um, they they will focus on other arenas, such as um, the car industry, but pharmacy is using these quite heavily. And I believe you should have a fishbone diagram that Nadia, Nadia is my intern currently. Um, she's quiet today, but Sometimes if we hear the talk, she'll be up here in a few minutes to explain the diagram to you later on today. And she just loves my rotation. All right. So let's talk about quality. So the primary goal for every health system is to provide safe and quality, high quality care. And quality can be defined as a degree or grade of excellence or work. And so this is a scenario that we're going to talk about at the end of the lecture, and we're going to do our own, where the pharmacy manager at a well-known retail pharmacy decides to include pharmacy wait times as an issue on the agenda. And now we want to know what tools can we use and should we consider for brainstorming, um, a brainstorming session to help resolve the issue. So how many of you work currently at Walgreens, CVS, Walmart as a pharmacy tech? Okay, about four of you guys are five. Okay, great. Uh, hospital pharm uh, pharmacy tech? Any other realms I haven't mentioned? Long term care? Okay. All right. All right. So you will see some of these scenarios on a regular basis if you work in a retail setting. So we'll come up and I'm not even talk to you about that a little bit later. All right. So when we think about quality, there are several items and terms that we hear on a daily basis metrics, uh, best practices, benchmarking. You'll hear that a lot in pharmacy. Process was the process improvement. Um, if you have an evaluation process, the strategic procedure, industry, and results. So we want to focus on some of these tools that we talk about on a regular basis, but these are methodologies. So these are some of the things that you'll hear on a regular basis when talking about quality. The Institute of Medicine has six aims for improvement in today's healthcare system. Overall, healthcare should be safe, effective, timely. Efficient, equitable, and patient-centered. So what does that mean? So if we want a healthcare system to be safe, we want to make sure that the patients avoid any type of injuries or harm. We have situations in the healthcare system where harm comes to patients. We have to investigate it, find out what the uh, pinpoint, what the issue was, and try to resolve it. So we want to make sure that any time you enter a healthcare system, we also want it to be effective. We want to make sure that we provide services based on scientific knowledge to all who could benefit or refrain from any, providing any services that are not likely to benefit the patient. We want it to be timely. So we want to reduce wait times. We want to reduce harmful delays for a patient. And then we want to make sure that the, the care is also efficient. So what do we do? We want to avoid waste. We hear that a lot in the next couple slides we'll talk about. There's too many waste of equipment, waste of supplies, and ideas of energy. Who wants to have meetings all day and discuss the same thing over and over and over, and we're not making sure that things are being improved. We also want healthcare to be equitable. So we want to provide care that does not vary in quality because of personal characteristics, such as gender, ethnicity, geographic location, and socioeconomic status. And lastly, we want it to be patient centered. The patient is our most important person when it comes to uh, quality. So we want to make sure that we provide care that's actually respectful, that we're responsive to the patient, that the individual preferences or needs of the patient are being met, and 
that we ensure that we are looking at the patient's values and that we, they guide all of our critical decisions. Because some patients, they don't want care. They say, I refuse care, we have to respect that. Um, there are family members that say, I don't I want to refuse care because I don't want my loved one to suffer, but yet the loved one wants to have every possibility to get that care taken care of them. So we have to respect those things. So in pharmacy practice, how do we do this? Okay? We how do we ensure safe delivery of care? How do we increase the probability of the desired patient outcome? And how do we reduce adverse outcomes? So there's something specific to pharmacy. We must realize that pharmacists are well positioned to actually improve the quality of care for patients. And it is in our expertise of those particular medications that we can help the patients and be very great members of the healthcare system. Um, pharmacy, I would say, over the last 10 or 15 years um, has become really the cornerstone of what healthcare means to institutions. A lot of times the pharmacist is put in the back, on the, in the back corner, we don't need your assistance. But more and more, medications are a part of what is necessary for patients to receive on a regular basis. We should be in the middle of quality because of that reason, for the reason. So we must look at quality measures in order to do all of these things. Asking ourselves, have our goals been achieved? What opportunities have been identified and that we need to improve on? And if we know what those goals are or opportunities are, then we move to our uh, quality improvement. So if we're not achieving our goals, we must consider quality improvement strategies, which should be system focused and continuous. That's gonna be very important. Quality measures focus on structure, process, and outcome. This is a key slide for you guys, so you know, kind of uh, put some notes next to some of these slides that I mentioned. So Dr. quality Green, measures focus on structure. Dr. Green, sorry to interrupt. I didn't get the slides, so I can drop it to the class, or do you want to send it after? No, I just put my address in for you. So 
of patient satisfaction is in the 97th percentile. You want to make sure that that's happening. You want to make sure that you have a reduction in thrombolytic events, and then no healthcare associated infections. So these are some examples of the what, the how, and the results. So when we talk about outcomes, we want to make sure that um, outcomes measures can be clinical. So for efficacy and safety purposes, that they're humanistic. We focus on the patient and what they're feeling about it and what their quality of life may be, and then we're focusing on the cost. So is the drug, is, are we focusing on clin the clinical aspect of the drug? Are we focusing on the quality of life of the patient? And are we focusing on if they can't afford it? Because if the patient can't afford it, what happens? We see a lot of discount products now, right, in the pharmacy. We have ZRX. Um, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Other pharmacies have discounts on their medications sometimes. Um, you all probably know this at local retail say, a lot of times we don't know that the discount being added to our prescription until uh, a year later and they say, oh, we were adding a discount from a CDS standpoint and now we can't allow that discount any further, so you have to pay exactly what your insurance says. So everybody is trying to work on to ensure that the patient can actually afford their medication now because if they can't, then they end up in the hospital and you know insurance companies do not like that. So quality insurance, uh, quality improvement, excuse me, should be, should support innovation. It should engage in rapid cycle learning. So you need to know this. This identifies, implements, and measures change. Change is made to improve the process of the system. So rapid cycling is a rapid learning cycle. It ensures that we're identifying, implementing, and measuring change to improve a process in the system. We want to make sure that it evaluates efforts around the country. So if somebody's doing something great at MD Anderson, we want that information to be shared with other institutions in other states and other countries because the stronger we are as a whole, the stronger our patients will be. We want to disseminate evidence about what works. If something's working at the more Harmon Southwest, we're going to disseminate that information to Maura Herman and TMC because we want to make sure that we're all on the same page, helping our patients as much as we can. So we want to make sure that we do that. So this is some terminology that you will need to know as well. This is page 12, focusing on quality assurance versus quality improvement. Quality assurance is what used to be said about 20 years ago. Quality improvement is the terminology now. So quality assurance is considered to be reactive. Um, the set of activities used to ensure a process leads to the products that meet quality standards. So quality assurance focuses on conforming to standards, focusing on what went wrong, always focusing on what went wrong. Um, it's punitive. It says, who was at fault for this error? What happened? And then the individual assignment or department has a function. So they don't talk about the entire hospital when this error occurs. They only talk about the pharmacy department, for example. And they complete the process just to address that one problem, okay? So it's definitely reactive. When the problem occurs, these are the things that take place. The only benefit is that future improvements in services or products. So let's say there's only one problem. Once you resolve it, you're good to go. It should never happen again, all right? So that's the only benefit for quality insurance using that terminology. So then we have quality improvement or quality continuous improvement. And this is a set of testing activities used to confirm certain components of a final product in order to meet quality standards. What that means is that you're always focusing on improving your performance, no matter what. If nothing's going wrong, you're still working on improving. Um, there's ongoing, repeated, over time, continuous process improvement. It's not judgmental, and no one gets blamed. It's focusing on fixing the actual issue, so no blame. It also is an interdisciplinary function, which means that Let's say a patient um, got the wrong medication and they want to focus on pharmacy, but the medication came from a dentist at the hospital. So we have to look at each step of what actually occurred and look at nursing. How did they pull the medication? Was it placed in the fixes correctly? Uh, when they pulled it, did they use barcode scanning to scan it before they gave it to the patient? So there's a lot of tools that have been improved on the institution side. Barcode scan is just in the retail space. You scan the drug, make sure you have the right thing, you scan the bottle. So all of these things are continuous and they involve everyone that is involved with the patient care. And the process is that it's proactive. So that's very important. You're already focusing on 
what may be needed, what may be improved before anything is to happen. And then the benefit is it's decreased cost as a result of fewer errors. If a patient takes the wrong medication, has a bad effect, that patient's gonna be in the hospital longer, um, they can sue, it can be all kinds of issues. Okay, so we wanna make sure that we know the difference between those two, quality insurance and quality improvement. So these are some quality improvement methodologies that I wanted to introduce to you. Um, and I'm gonna focus on some of these that you will need to know uh, for examination purposes. But we'll talk about Lean Six Sigma, PDSA, gap analysis, and benchmarking. All right, these are a few quality improvement methodologies. So the Lean one is probably one of the most difficult ones to remember or recall, but just know that it was derived from the Toyota production system. So basically from cars, this particular system focused on that. Um, it's a systematic method to reduce waste within the manufacturing system without actually uh, sacrificing any productivity which can cause problems. You have a couple of tools specifically to lean, um, and I'll kind of talk about lean um, in a, a couple of slides, but specific to lean that you can consider when you're working in any institution or pharmacy day. You have the, um, the value stream mapping, you have the Kaizen Improvement System, and then you have the Plan Do um, Check Act, or PDSA, and then you have the Seven Pillars of Productive Maintenance and Bias. So basically what you'll need to know by looking at this is what tools fall into what area. So you'll need to know the tool for me, so just FYI, so make sure that you're aware of that. You don't need to know the details behind the tools, but you need to know what tools are focused on them, okay? All right. You also need to know this. There are five principles of lean. Okay? You have your defining the value, which is understanding what value the customer assigns to the product or service. So if um, I get my prescription from Walgreens Pharmacy, and if I know that I can go and pick it up immediately, then the value of what that does for me, because I don't have to worry about it, I can go through the drive through which never happens. But if it goes through the drive through pick up my medication and go home in five minutes, that's going to increase my value um, of this particular product. Map value stream. So the totality of the product's life cycle from raw materials to customer use. When you think about pharmacy, what is that life cycle that when the patient, when the prescription is sent to the pharmacy, um, it's then it's sent to the pharmacy from the doctor where it's dropped off. What's the process of filling that? What's the insurance need? Um, when can the patient pick it up? Is it on back order? And then the patient finally comes to pick it up. How long does that process take? So it's a value stream map, and a lot of organizations use this to find out where the gaps are in the system. So we'll talk about gap analysis later. Creating flow. So it creates a value chain with no interruption in the product in the production process. So after you do your value stream map and find the gaps, then you create this flow that you don't have any issues in to make sure that you're eliminating waste. Establish a pool. So this takes that nothing is made until the customer orders it to reduce cost. This is the same for you're not going to fill a prescription until the patient calls for it, all right? And then pursue perfection. Um, continuous improvement as, uh, address the root causes of quality problems and waste. So this is a cycle. So lean is about defining the value, doing the map, map value stream, creating the flow, establishing the pool, and then pursuing perfection over and over. Six Sigma, on the other hand, they also have tool uh, values that I'm going to define in a second, but this was actually invented by Motorola for the goal to specify a tolerance, tolerance limits for defective products geared to three point four defects per million opportunities. This DPMO, everybody has concerns with it, so I'm going to try to explain it the best way I can. Um, just so you'll know, I'm not going to ask you to calculate anything on your exam, but I do want you to understand what it is. And so if you look at this um, bell-shaped curve, you'll see that six sigma refers to the very tiny area under the bell curve where there's a possibility of producing a defect and it's almost nil. Okay? So when you get to the six sigma of, a, of an issue at your institution, that means you have eliminated most waste and that you are doing so well that you don't have to necessarily worry about having an issue or a problem or coming up with a care. So, um, this Six Sigma process capability in the middle of the pay 
Cheney talks about defects per million opportunities. So every opportunity there is, and I'm going to give you an example of what that looks like. So listen carefully. Let's say that a local shop fills 300 drink orders, and 250 of those orders were free of errors. That means for 250 to start 300, that was 50 errors that were counted. But there were 300 drink orders. The menu provides 20 different options for coffee. So looking at the calculation that they did for this EP and low, and I don't think I put the calculation up there. I'll send it to you guys. But basically, we look at taking the errors, dividing that by the number of um, samples or drink orders. We multiply that by the different types of drink orders. Multiply that by one million, and you get your defects per million. So when I do that, when I say 50 divided by 300, multiplied by the 21 different types of drink orders that they could have and multiply that by a million, that gives me 7,900 7, defects. If we look at that, that falls between three and four. So you still have a lot of errors going on. That's the purpose of just understanding. So when I get to a defect that's anything between two, four, and five, six sigma, it's still a defect that I need to address. So this is what they use. They look at how many, um, let's say how many prescriptions they filled, how many prescriptions had errors, and then they multiply that to the different types of situations that could occur with the filling of the error. And then they multiply that by a million and come up with their defects per one million opportunities. That's this DP and all. I'm not going to ask you to define it, but I just wanted to give you a, an understanding of how they, they use a calculation to come up with a number and determine if they're at, at six or one. All right? So this is the Six Sigma methodology. You will need to know this, because you'll need to know the difference between the lean methodology and the Six Sigma methodology, all right? So they're very similar. The wording, wording is just different. So they have a define, so define the problem and the project goal. Measure the key aspects of the current process and collect the relevant data. Analyze the data to investigate and verify the cause and effect relationships. Improve or optimize the current process based on that analysis, and then control the future process to ensure that any deviations from the target are corrected. Okay? So you got these five purpose areas, and we call them demand. So every time we talk about demand, we're talking about six sigma. And then we have our lean methodologies. Everybody's clear on that. What word did you demand? Demand. Then lastly, you have what's called Lean Six Sigma. So you have companies that have put the two together to come up with a way to ensure that they have no defects. All right? Um, I am a Lean Six Sigma Green Belt. And so um, when it comes to projects, I'm on the projects, on the Lean projects. And I'll go into the details of those definitions because we need to know that too. So Lean and Six Sigma are very similar. You see the differences or the similarities, I should say, in the slide here. So lean, focusing on reducing waste to increase the customer value. Project leaders <coughs> engage in uh, the team members to make sure that they can focus on the project. Major drivers around the customer satisfaction as far as lean is concerned. Using lean tools, which I talked about, Kaizen, value stream mapping, five and TPM. And then measures with your cycle time, your inventory time. So how do you measure that you will have a lean process? Six Sigma, they actually use stats to improve the process through reducing variation. So you're still reducing waste regardless of whether it's using stats or using some type of uh, tool. Uh, belts, which is what I talked about just now, they lead projects and work to improve the process by pushing change onto people. So you have a lot of belts, uh, Lean Six Sigma belts, that work in institutions now. That's all they do. They take on projects. We have one, AUTMB. They go to each department and they take on various projects that can reduce waste and improve um, outcomes as well as increase costs. So they're usually across all systems now. <clears throat> you also have major drivers around customer satisfaction, critical to quality, critical to the customer, and profitability. Uses the main method and quality tools. And then the measures is defects per million opportunities. So that's what we talked about already. So Lean Six Sigma together focuses on improving the effectiveness and eliminating waste. Produce um, increase in customer value and satisfaction. So we focus on eliminating waste and improving customer satisfaction. Those are the main things when Lean Six Sigma comes together. All right? You don't have any people focusing on lean 
Four six sigma sex relief. Now you will hear the six six sigma <coughs> Are there any questions about that? All right. So these are the belts. So individuals can be certified in the six sigma. Uh, it is a certification that can help validate professionals who are skilled in identifying risk organization errors or defects in a specific business model or process. And then um, they focus on remo removing that. So you have your white belt. This is actually probably raw line to get. It's just an introduction to um, Lean Six Sigma altogether. So you probably raw line to get this. I know several students have done this white belt training. Um, yellow belt, they actually participate as project team members. This is when you start getting into the certification realm and they review processes for improvement. And then you have your green belt, they can actually lead green belt projects. They also assist in data collection and analysis to, uh, for the black belts. And you have your black belt. The black belt is usually the person that you're hiring in an institution, but they want them to lead a problem solving project and they train or coach all of the teams to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then you have a master black belt. They also train and coach, um, but their function is at the Six Sigma program level. So a lot of them are not necessarily in institutions, but they're training everybody from the black belt on down to the white belt, okay? So you will have, I was, um, I didn't know that that we had a lean Six Sigma uh, process um, or group, ABP. But when I found out that we were about to do a pharmacy project in the department, they were going over these tools and they said, okay, we have a question. How do you know all this? And I said, well, I'm a green belt. I didn't really want to just know because I don't, I rarely use it. I rarely use my green belt certification. I think I got it probably almost 10 years ago. But I, I don't use it, um, I should say, to, I use it for my own projects, my work projects, to make sure that my projects are successful, but I don't necessarily use it from an institution standpoint. So, but it's, it's very useful, especially if you understand it, know what you need to do to decrease waste in your organization, it can be a very useful tool. All right, so let's talk about um, PDSA. So PDSA or PDCA, you would hear a lot in the hospital They've been using PDSA or PDCA forever. Before Lean Six Sigma came along, a lot of because it's simple. It's simple to remember. You plan, you do, you study, you act. And so with PDSA or PDCA, excuse me, which can be used interchangeably, there are three questions that must be asked when you're using PDSA methodology. What are we trying to accomplish? Which is your aim? How will we know that the change has actually resulted in improvement, which is your current hours, and then what changes can we make that will result in an improvement, okay? So these are the questions that you ask anytime you're working on any projects. You can use this model. Like I said, the institutions use it on a regular basis and focusing on aim and current knowledge, and that's a cycle for learning and improvement. And as I said before, the plan, you identify the opportunity for improvement and plan to change. You do. You implement the change on a small scale if you want to, like a pilot. You study it or you check it. You collect the data on the change compared to the baseline data that you have. Study those effects of the changes as a pilot project and then show the effects of the change over time if necessary. And then you act. If the change is successful, then you implement it on a wider scale and continuously assess the results. The three methodologies that I would introduce you to Today, you say the same thing. They just say it in a different way. They do the same thing. Start off with the process, you find what the area is or issue is, you start breaking the process, and then you continue to improve it. That's it. That's the main focus of all of these systems. Somebody's just getting paid to name these different systems and then you really do these. <laughs> all right, so a gap analysis. Um, it is basically a needs assessment. Okay, so it's a method of assessing the differences in the actual performances and desired performance at your job, basically the gap between where your current state is and where you want to be. So what's your target? So that's what you'll see below. So uh, you want to list the recommendation or standard, assess if we're compliant with that standard, identify any gaps between the best practice and the current process, and then you document an action plan for each situation. So how many of you that work in, as a pharmacy tech, have identified gaps in which you currently live? And you mentioned it to the pharmacist and it resulted in a change. Anybody? Don't be shy. Nobody? Everything works perfectly at your pharmacy. No. So what have you done to try to improve it? Have you done anything? No? Yes, maybe? Not anything? You said pretty shy? Um, okay, so COVID first happened or whatever. Um, it was just a 
done by the actual workers. Management can actually say, we have a problem. But in order for that problem to be resolved, they need to go to the actual workers to say, how would you recommend resolving this issue? We may put all the tools in place or recommend tools, but we need the input of all of the employees to make sure that we're going in the right direction. So nobody wants a, a manager or supervisor to tell them what to do when they already know their job. But it happens every day. So it's very important for you all to know some of these tools so you can assist someone or your manager or supervisor in moving to the next level. All right, so the next tool is benchmarking. We talk about a lot about this, especially when we talk about research, um, activities, and we want to make sure that we are measuring appropriately. We're using the appropriate measure to measure our success. So you'll hear your professors or your preceptors say, um, let me see if I can find a benchmark set. So what is, what is Harris Health doing for um, the Meds to Best program? What is their benchmark setting? How are they successful? And can I generalize that into what I'm doing now? Okay, depending on my institution. So you measure another product or service, you compare it to improve one's own product or service, and it can be internal, it can be external, or it can be functional as a reference. So for example, if you have a antimicrobial stewardship program, at your institution at Memorial Hermann Southwest, like I said before, but you don't have to add Memorial Hermann TMC. Then you may want to talk to them about using your model to pilot that in another institution. Um, also external, let's say you're doing something great at Methodist and UTMB would like to, to institute that. So we look at their benchmark to see what can we do that matches up with their success. And then of course, you're using it as a reference. Like we always talk about assembly lines for cars, but there are assembly lines for pharmacies that, um, especially in like long-term care, um, they may have assembly lines, or those pharmacies like HEB, they have their own warehouses where people are actually in a warehouse in Walmart. They have some type of assembly line. So you can use it as a reference. Um, it doesn't focus on your particular um, type of work, but the assembly line process is limited itself to all other organizations and types of work. Would you also say benchmarking is useful for accreditation purposes? Yes. So if you're trying to get accredited and you know that um, there's institutions that have already been accredited and they were accredited quickly because of what they did, then yes, you want to use it as a benchmark. So for example, uh, a good question. We have a specialty pharmacy that we started two years ago. Specialty pharmacy is booming. So if you have any um, plans of doing a residency, I recommend you consider specialty pharmacy because that's definitely where the money is. But um, so we, have, we started off two years ago and we looked at different institutions. We're about to embark on accreditation. And so we're really looking at various institutions now to see what they're doing, how they're doing it. Because we want to learn from their mistakes, not make any, and get accredited quickly. So we will start accreditation um, process, uh, accreditation process in July this year. So yes, that is very important. So we're gonna talk about some quality improvement um, analysis tools. And so what you see, uh, examples that are in white are not included in the presentation. There are a lot of examples here. I did not include affinity diagrams, histograms, or run control charts. But what I will say is an affinity diagram focuses on like an organization chart. You want me to know that. Um, histograms or bar graphs are like um, talk about the average of a particular process that you're working on and they re represent the frequency of distribution. And then run control charts focus on how the process, uh, how a process may change over time. So we're not going to get into those because we don't necessarily see those as often in the healthcare setting. But we will talk about cause and effect diagrams, the fish bone you have in front of you that we'll be doing one day. Root cause analyses, failure modes, and, and effects analyses, which is FMEA, flow charts, Pareto charts, scatter plots, and quality dashboards. So these are the tools that we use to analyze data. Okay? You will need to know that these are analysis tools. So you see some, a question that says, what, which one of these tools are analysis tools? And you need All right, so this is a fishbone diagram. Why do you think it's a reactive approach? Because 
It already happened. Correct. That's it. It already happened. The problem has already occurred. So then we need to figure out what caused the problem. So that's the bones of the fish. The head of the fish is what the defect was, and then the problem, or what caused it. With this approach, people use either the seven M's or the five P's. They use machine, method, man, materials, mother nature, management, and measurement, or they use processes, people, procedures, places, and policies. This is an easier way to name the high-level pieces of the causes, and then they put their information over there. So, give you this example. So this is what we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. We had a wait time issue with the pharmacy, um, and now we want to know what causes. So this gives you an idea of what caused it. So let's talk about man, which is people. So I, so I use the M's. I use six of the M's and not seven, but I use the M's. So man is people. Um, maybe the wait times are long because the staff is fatigued. They're tired. They don't move as fast. Uh, there's a pressure of getting the line down. I've seen technicians have a whole meltdown in the pharmacy because too many people in, line, in the line and that's what they're focusing on. <laughs> Um, lack of formal training, training. You have somebody that's new in there. I remember, this is a nightmare of mine. I um, worked <coughs> part-time at Walmart um, off the South Coast Coast. And I would only work on the weekends because I had a job at the hospital, but it was just my opportunity to look at all types of drugs. And what I will tell you is if you're focused on a formulary at your institution, you never get an idea of what the other drugs are. So those of you that are working in retail, it's a good overview of all the drugs that come through. And they put me with a pharmacy technician that was brand new. And me being a part-time person, it wasn't for, I worked once a month. I, I said, if you put me with somebody that knows what they're doing, so I want to deal with the insurance stuff, I'm fine. But she did, oh, it was horrible. And we only filled 100 prescriptions that day, and it felt like we filled 900. I was so tired at the end of the day. But if you don't have anybody that's trained, this can also cause problems. Right? Lack of pharmacy resources. Somebody calls in, you're short. That can cause wait time to increase. <coughs> okay, let's talk about the method, bless you, or the process. Let's do it. You have um, pharmacy workflow, your, your workflow process. Maybe the, the pharmacy was set up where it's not conducive to filling prescriptions in a great flow. Uh, timely phone message retrieval. You didn't get to the phone soon enough to determined this patient had the doctor call in six hours ago. So now you look at your phone system to see where the phone call was. Um, you don't have a problem solving, you don't have a way to problem solve. Or there's just a communication failure. Patient was waiting, you told them to move to the side, forgot about them, you had to bring them back in front of somebody that also was waiting. Then you have machine or equipment failure. So the equipment failed, there's no automation, drive through is packed, uh, or there's a lack of automation. Then you have your management. Your supervisor or your manager, they didn't staff accordingly. So there's a staffing issue. And then Mother Nature. So the peak times, lines are long because people after 5 o'clock come to get their prescription. The pharmacy closed on Sunday, so you have a mad rush on Friday or Saturday or Monday. And then the design of the physical environment, also with this. The materials, the prescriptions, you can't read them, so which is not the case anymore. But now everything's electronic for the most part. But you have eligible uh, prescriptions. Prescription's not available for pickup. Prescription has no refill. Prescription was sent to the wrong pharmacy. So these are some of the things that can happen, and this is how we try to resolve the issue. So a lot of times in retail setting or the institution or any pharmacy setup, they'll say, hey, let's take a look and see what caused this issue so we can focus on that. So say if you put all these things in here, the real cause was people and training. Then that's what we focus on. All right, then you have your root cause analysis. We don't know what is below the actual plant, right? We got this weed that's on the surface, but we don't know anything that's going on that has contributing factors, underlying issues, and we have to drill down to find out what actually happened. So, for example, this is also a reactive approach. We will need to know that that the digital diagram is reactive, and the root cause analysis is reactive as well. So, with reactive approaches, the problem has already occurred. So somebody says to you, um, I haven't, you know, I've been like up all night. So then your question is try to get to the root cause. You ask questions. Um, why can't you sleep? 
they said, oh, I drank too much coffee and it made me stay late. Why are you drinking coffee? And they may say, because I had a last minute project that I had to work on, so I had to stay up, I had to study. Um, and then, so the next question is, well, why are you working on a project last minute? Right? So I didn't manage my time well. And then the next question is, well, why don't you manage your time well? So this is how you actually get to the root cause. People sit in a room and they start asking questions to get to the root. All right? So it's also reactive. This one is a little bit daunting, but I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it is a proactive way, a proactive analysis tool at the VA. So they focus on looking at a process that could, to, could lead to harm. So let's say I want to institute some new project and I want to make sure that it works. So I take this and I look at the steps in the process. I say, why can the process fail? So you'll see the steps in the process. And you'll say, for example, orders are written for new medications. We're going to do a new process where the orders are written uh, via different tools. We're using it. We got a new email. And so how can that fail? The first dose may be given prior to the pharmacist review of the order. So we're testing out this new EMR, and one of the failure could be that the first dose is given but the pharmacist hasn't reviewed the drug yet. And then what caused that failure? Medications orders may be available and need to be accessed from a dispensing machine that are stopping or taking it out, even though the pharmacist hasn't reviewed the order. And then what is the effect of that? The patient may receive the incorrect medication, incorrect dose, or dose via the incorrect route. Okay? All because we're starting a new EMR, and this is what we're most worried about to potentially happen. Then there's a scale from 1 to 10 that tells you what is the likelihood that this could occur. And so this is random. They just assign a number to it based on what their thoughts are. I think that this is likely to occur, I think it's 6 out of 10, right? Then they say, what is the likelihood that it will be detected? They say, 5 out of 10. And then what is the severity of this happening? Like what could happen? They didn't think it was too severe, so there's a one. And then there's a risk profile number, and all they did was multiply those numbers. Six times five times one is 30. So that is the risk profile number that they've assigned to this. And then uh, what are the actions? Assign a clinical pharmacist to patient care unit so that all medication orders can be reviewed if they occur. It's that simple. We look at the steps, what failure can occur, what the failure can cause, what the effects of the failure is, assign a number to the likelihood of the occurrence and detection, and the severity, multiply those numbers together, you get your risk profile number. So after they look at all of these numbers, then they say, you know what, the risk profile number for orders are written to discontinue a medication or change the existing order, the risk profile number is 250. That's why I'm going to purchase code number. Flow chart. Love flow chart. You'll see this probably more than anything at institutions or um, uh, different places in pharmacy. And this is very simple. You notice this is your grocery store list. All right? So what I want to point out to you is that these flow um, shapes, they actually mean something. A lot of people put flows together and they have no idea that they need something. So if you have Microsoft Office Suite and you have Visio, you'll see these flowchart flow chart shape, shapes in Visio. The oblong shape is the start and the finish. The um, square shapes are the flow, and then the diamond shapes are when a change occurs and you can say yes or no. Those are the main shapes, those three, that's it. They have other shapes that you can use for various reasons, but this is what you see on a regular basis, all right? So our start is you make your grocery store list, then your flow is you get in the car, you drive to the grocery store, you get out of the car, you enter the store, you get a shopping basket, you get produce, then you ask yourself, do I need meat? If you don't need meat, you go to the next, you go to the no step. If you do, you go to the butcher, place the order, obtain the meat, and then you go back to get other items. Did you forget anything, yes or no? And it changes your direction based on those yes or no diamonds, okay? And so the last thing is you put your groceries in the car. Very simple. Very simple. It's a very simple flow. I'm going to give you an example of what that looks like when you're in a pharmacy setting. So, and I know this is not very, you'll be able to see it on the PowerPoint, but this is focusing on our Meds to Beds program. We wanted to put a flow together 
to start a best to best program in HIV. We did our benchmarking. We looked at different institutions to see what they did, how they did it, how well it worked, and then we moved forward with our own. So this is how we were able to find gaps as well. So when the patient is admitted to the hospital, does the nurse introduce best to best for patients? That's what they're supposed to do. If they don't, then we need the care manager to do it. So we have a checklist in our EMR that shows us that the nurse gave um, the patient a review of our best to best program when they were admitted to the hospital. If they don't, then we go to the next step. So you'll see these changes or these flows, and this is what we do actually for every project that we have in pharmacy and TMB, every one of them has a flow chart. So everybody knows what's going on. When somebody new starts, we give them this as a part of their um, overview and orientation. So they'll know this is what we do for best events, this is what we do for special pharmacy, etc. Every project has one. The next one is a Pareto chart. This process is also um, reactive because it wants to figure out what actually caused the problem. So it prioritizes potential causes and sub-causes of a problem. So with this, what you'll see is it shows the frequency of the event and includes the rank order of the event for comparison. So you'll need to know this. So let's say, for example, um, what caused you to be late to work? Okay? Was it traffic, child care, transportation, weather, that you overslept or emergency? So what happens, why here, if I say, well, most of the time, my employees are late to work because it's just too much traffic in Houston. There may be for an opportunity for me to say, well, on Mondays and Fridays, I'll have you work from home, just to give that as an example. But you use these in order to figure out how you can move forward, even though it's a reaction. These things have already occurred. The left axis, uh, the left y axis bar is the number of occurrences. The right, the right y axis bar is cumulative percentage. The line equals cumulative percent of each category. The height of each bar equals the frequency of occurrence, and the x-axis lists all the categories. So it's very simple. You put all your data in the Pareto chart and determine what your issue is. We use Pareto charts at UTMB for uh, hospital readmissions. We determined that we had too many hospital readmissions for patients that had heart failure and COPD. So we had to formed a readmissions committee and looked at the reason for readmission and we put those in a Pareto chart. And what we found was that, I guess I'm going to say what well, public transportation was, that's where we medication errors were. Patients either didn't get their medication or they didn't take their medication. And so what we did was we started a mess in program. And so that public transportation ended up being, or where it was, it was even lower than where emergency is after we started the mess event program. So these tools really work because then you can determine, okay, what do I need to do to make sure that I fix the situation? And now they don't even invite us to the meetings because pharmacy's not, there's no issue. All right, so then we have these scatter plots. They show the relationship or correlation between two sets of data. So how does one variable change with the change in another, basically? I'm sure you've seen this before. So on uh, the plot that's top left is strong positive. The taller you are, the larger your shoe size. I'm just giving you like some random examples, right? So if you as you as you as your height grows, then your shoe size probably grows as well. A strong negative, as you increase your study time, the less this is number two. Um, as you increase your study time, the less time you are active on social media. So if I'm increasing my study time, then I may not be as active on social media. So that's kind of a, an example of, it's kind of a strong negative that what you do may impact something at a lower rate. And then you have the no correlation. So no correlation, a shoe size and how active you are on social media has no correlation, right? So you may not see anything as a nine. You may have a weak positive, a moderate negative, or a weak negative, or a uh, moderate positive, and a weak positive. So these are some things that people use when they, they may stay in an institution that I want to see how um, medication errors correlate with, re with uh, re hospitalization. We know that's going to be high. If patient takes the medication wrong, takes the wrong medication, then they're going to, so that's going to be a strong line. Okay. Then we have our quality dashboard. A lot of institutions use this because they want to make sure that they 
have a display of the project and that all the members of the team have access to it so they want to be able to see what's what. And so you want to make sure that you're looking at your dashboard, keeping up with it, and determining what's going on, okay? All right. How much time I have? 20 minutes, right? Is that right? It's 420? Mm-hmm. All right. Our performance improvement method. I know I started late, so I was just trying to make sure. So meditation use and value, uh, meditation use evaluation. This is the last thing that I'm going to talk about before we get to our quick, quick um, activity. So a lot of times when we want to look at performance improvement, we focus on the NUE. We hear that a lot in drug information. So if you have drug information on a patient, you will do an NUE for sure. So the meditation use evaluation includes the background, objectives, and rationale for taking the medication or adding the drug formulary, the design, criteria for evaluating the drug, the outcomes, and the references. So anytime you are evaluating a drug for it to be added to the formulary, you want to make sure that you have all the information that you need. So if I have um, Ozempic, which is a very popular drug, but I want to add uh, Trulicity, what is the difference between these two drugs? What's going to be better for the institution? Maybe Ozempic and Trulicity are pretty much equivalent when it comes to their um, how they work. Uh, indication, dosing, contraindications are all the same, but it's cheaper for the, for the hospital to, to order Ozempic. So that's what we order. So you do a lot of medication use evaluations to determine um, is it going to be cost effective for the institution? Is it better for the patient? So if all things are equal, then that's fine. But if it's not, if we see more, when we look at references, if we see more harm to certain patients for certain drugs, then we know that we're going to use something else. And then some external. External mandates. So, who measures quality, you guys? Everybody does. Medicare, Medicaid, insurance companies, governmental agencies, accreditation agencies, they measure quality because if something happens to that patient and that patient ends up back in the hospital, you better believe that the insurance company is coming after the hospital. They don't want to take any, they don't want any blame for something that happens. So, everybody's measuring quality now because we want to make sure that the patient is being taken care of and they're being treated accordingly. So, everybody measures. So some of the quality uh, requirements, some state boards um, require pharmacies to have a QA or a CQI program, often with a focus on medication safety. Um, the Texas State Board of Pharmacy, or Texas became the first state to pass legislation focusing on CQI to evaluate the quality of pharmacy. So you may have somebody coming in to evaluate your pharmacy based on quality or something like that. So it's very important for you to take a look at that and see um, when you're working in your pharmacy, if you become a PCFP, PIC, whatever that looks like, you need to make sure you know these requirements for quality. And then you have national quality organizations. I'm not going to test you on these, but it's good to know them because they have a lot of good information, especially Joint Commission, the Hospital Quality Alliance, Medicare Prescriptions Drugs, the actual Modernization Act of 2003 has great information. CMS, you know, they're always going to keep up to date with what's going on. And, especially with medication therapies. AHRQ, it gives you what's going on out there in research, uh, other institutions, and what they're able to, how they're able to improve their quality, and they get uh, opportunities to review those in the NCQA. So those are all good organizations to review. And then you have your pharmacist role. So what do you do in the pharmacist? You want to um, advocate, advocate for the patient's optimal therapy and health care. You want to make sure that you're adhering to all standards of care. You should get involved in continuous quality improvement projects to make sure you're taking care of your patients. And then get into the leadership role. Pharmacists are leading the medication use and safety um, committees, medication error reduction committees, monitoring high risk medication, and then medication reconciliation. Like I said, those are huge now. People are looking at pharmacists more so than they ever did, especially when I was in pharmacy school. Um, we were just starting out with getting recognized as being a uh, residency trained pharmacist, even though residency has been going on for years before 2004. But now, at MD Anderson, for example, even at UTMB, the doctors do not want to round without their pharmacists with them. So you have an opportunity to make a great impact. So, Nadia, any questions?
I don't much. It's limited. Limited what? Yeah, very expensive. So if they have orphan drugs, are they going to be worried about that drug most of the time? Because they only have a small sample size of people? No. Okay. That's the other thing. Yeah, so if you have orphan drugs, you have a limited amount of people in there. So say you have like someone with some rare disease. Yes, so machine breakdowns could be one of them. 